Good morning, church. Happy Sunday. Uh, you want to stand with us and uh, greet those around you with uh, the peace of the Lord, a loving uh, handshake or a high five or a look in the eyes. Yeah, fist bump is appropriate. We're going to worship Jesus this morning. He's the reason why we're gathered. Today, um, we're going to be reminded, and we were reminded during just our run through this morning of just the joy of the Lord, and uh, we uh, we were just taking full advantage to just um, to just rest in the joy uh, that He has for us. Um, we were 
they were cracking jokes on me left and right. <laughs> it, was, it was great. Um, but as we as we kind of enter into worship together uh, this morning, um, I just want to I just want to just pray that over us that uh, the, the Lord's joy would just come and just rest. Uh, there's so much going on right now with just with heavy hearts, and uh, thank you for the rain, Lord, and um, just everything going on. Um, I just want to just want us to rest that um, even in those even in those moments of just tough tough life. That uh, joy of the Lord is our strength. That that's uh, that's a safe harbor that we can go to. Um, so let's just be mindful of that as we just kind of offer ourselves uh, to our worship to Jesus this morning. Okay, cool. church say amen. 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 You may be seated. It is good to welcome you into the house of the Lord on this third Sunday of Advent as we once again prepare our hearts and minds for the celebration of the miracle of God becoming flesh and dwelling among us. So I just want to highlight a couple of announcements, most of which are in your bulletin, so I do hope you'll grab one of those. You may not need it for worship, but it's got some great stuff about what's happening. There are a lot of things happening, and the first thing I will tell you is if you weren't here earlier at 825 when we had the first version of the Images of Adoration, this choral presentation sung by our chancel choir, you're going to want to come back. I don't know what the weather's going to do, but the car can still get here. 3 p.m. this afternoon, I hope you'll come. Um, I heard a whole lot of people at 830 saying, I'm coming back just because I want to hear it again. 
So a lot of wet eyes as they were leaving, but I invite you to come, bring your family, just be a part of that musical offering as a way to worship and give thanks to God. That'll be at three o'clock this afternoon. The other things that are happening this week, I'll just, they're in here, but I'll just give them quick. Do come if you can come midweek. We have our last Advent service, 12 o'clock. It'll be in the sanctuary on Wednesday. Crystal Devine, who used to be a pastor here, is coming back. We love to have her when she comes back traveling from Durham. So we're glad that she's going to be here and bring the message. Then we'll meet in here for a quick lunch immediately following. Then you can go back to work or back to the day's activities. Thursday. Can you say Thursday? Thursday. 6 p.m. Please come or if if you know anybody that you'd like to bring with you. We're going to have another Blue Christmas service. If you don't know anything about this, if you don't understand why you should sing the blues sometimes around the, the Christmas season, um, it's, it's a service that is for healing and wholeness, especially for those during the holidays where there's some loss, some sense of grief because of maybe loved ones or things that are happening in their lives. We all come in various ways broken, right, in need of healing. So it, come be a part of this blue Christmas service, 6 o'clock. That'll be in building one in the fellowship hall, and we hope that you'll come. And then next Sunday, it's an interesting thing because it's going to be both the fourth Sunday of Advent in the morning. So we are going to have our regular fourth Sunday of Advent worship in the morning, but it won't be in this building. We'll only have one service. It's going to be a combined kind of acoustic set. Brian and Kristen are working together to bring the music. So we're we're, we're hoping for just like a, a beautiful kind of acoustic worship service, fourth Sunday of Advent, 1030 combined at the two, at, uh, in building two in the sanctuary. And then our normal Christmas Eve offerings. So at three o'clock, spontaneous Christmas pageant, bring your family and your kids to join us. Five o'clock here at the Beacon, candlelight communion, seven o'clock, traditional candlelight communion. I hope that you'll come celebrate once again the miracle of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, it is a privilege to gather in your name. We've already made allusion to the rain that is falling down outside and may continue to come, but Lord, we ask for your grace, your mercy, your love, your peace to rain down upon us. Give us an anointing that we might experience again, anew and afresh, the miracles that you have for us right here in this room the hope that you want us to leave with right here in this room, the peace, the love, the reason that we celebrate. Despite all the the noise of the marketing and the other things, the other kind of things that we get so caught up in this season, we ask that we make you the focus of everything that we do. Meet us at the point of our need this day, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. When God's people were surrounded by hardship, suffering, and grief, Isaiah proclaimed, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, And as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is the word of God for the people of God.
We come today as people who are also surrounded by suffering and grief, and yet the Spirit hovers among us, tending and anointing, inspiring freedom where there is captivity, declaring blessing in places the world has cursed, and igniting fierce joy where mourning and heartache prevail. We come today as people who are also, I'm sorry, we wait as people who experience hardship and pain, yet we are called to witness to the persistent joy that sustains our life as God's people. We light these candles as signs of our shocking hope, just peace and fierce joy. May our lives shine with the fierce, tenacious joy of the light who gives in our hearts as we wait and work for the coming of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you guys on this beautiful day. I don't care if it's raining, may it rain in here. This morning we uh, come with the prayers of the people, but I have a question to ask you that was asked of us um, before we got started this morning. And it was Brian that brought the question, why are we here? Why are you here? Is it because expectations? Are we expected to be here at Sunday so that's just what we do? Or do we come expecting something? If we come with that open heart, there's no doubt that God's going to feel that. So may this time of season where we get another thing that he used this morning that was in my spirit was our feelings. Our feelings can lead us astray. We can get wrapped up in our feelings. Our feelings can tell us stories. Uh, The kids say lie now. We couldn't use that word in, in my home. We couldn't say tell a lie, but our feelings can lie to us. May we go on the promises of God. He is here. He'll meet you here. So let me put my glasses back on. Prayers for Pastor Kevin and Denise for all they do. Prayers for a white Christmas. I did not write that, I promise you. No. Mm -mm. Prayers for Wayne and Mary Helen Anderson. Prayers for Charlie Johnson and Bonnie. Prayers for Michelle Williams and Barry Williams the ones traveling. Lois Edmonds' family in her passing and Sharon Gant's family with her passing. Please join our hearts and minds in prayer as we go and lift these up. Father, we just thank you right now for already being here before we ever got here this morning. Father, we... We just appreciate the opportunity and bless that we live in a country where we can just come and worship you and meet you here because, again, you were already waiting for us. Father, for the ones that have taken time to write names in the prayer journal, we thank you for laying them on your heart and them being obedient in writing those names. Father, you know every need, every need that has been written, spoken, but most of all, those that have been unspoken, you know those just as well. And we ask that you just work in the only way that you can and you will, and we'll give you honor and glory for that. 
for those that need healing. Father, we ask for that. But being mindful that the healing may not be on this side, but it may be on the other. Father, for the ones that have lost the loved ones, embrace them in only a way that you can and give them that comfort to fill that void. Father, for those that have been hurt, those that have been uh, just in turmoil with disappointments, Father, this is the time of year where we want to be excited and we see people gathering together. But Lord, on the inside, there's some that may be hurting. And we don't see that because they're good at hiding it. We ask that you be with them. Father, for the ones that don't know how to pray, may we stand in the gap for them. Use us, Lord. Minister us, Lord. But most of all, we just thank you for being able to come to you and just tell you how we feel. Your Abba Father. Your Daddy to us. And some days we need Daddy a little bit more. Father, thank you. We submit these prayers, again, that have been written down. But also the ones on our hearts as well, Lord. And we do ask that you um, be with us as we pray as you taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You guys are learning this about me. Before we move on to the next thing, before we just move on to the next thing in the bulletin, just stop for a minute. Just stop. joy it is to honor 
What a joy it is to honor the King. We'd like oh, to stand up the King of the Lord, King of the world is yours, it's yours. Don't come, all ye faithful, joyful and child.
You're worthy of praise. You're more worthy than a song, Jesus. You're worthy of our hearts, our lives, Jesus. church say amen. amen. If you believe the spirit of the Lord is in this place, would you say amen again? Amen. God is good amen. all the time. It doesn't matter whether there's two or three gathered on a rainy day or not. I know there's more than that, but it is good to be here. Amen. It is good to glorify his name. We are here to give him all the glory. So the gospel lesson, if you remain standing for just a moment, comes from John chapter 1. Thank you. John chapter 1. Skipping around a little bit, 6 through, actually probably 9, and then down to verse 19. Hear now the word of the Lord. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. Down in verse 19. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, then What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am a voice. (laughs) I want you to stop there for a second. I am a voice. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them and said, I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know, one who is coming after me. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across from the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, Roz, when uh, Sister Tammy was going to lead us in prayer, she was going to ask the same question, but it's a good thing. It's kind of like the Holy Spirit already knew. I kind of wanted to begin by asking you a question. But I want to start with the same one, but I I want to expand it a little bit. I want to ask you a question. Why are you here? And I know you might have lots of answers to that. For the kids here, you might be because, well, somebody told me to come and we came. I don't know. And that someone was probably your parents. (laughs) Why are you here? But but I want to go underneath that. I want to ask the deeper question today. I've been really thinking long and hard about testimony, the importance of, of witness. Why are you Christian if you are? And if you're not, I'm glad you're here to learn more. But why? We might even go a layer underneath that. Why church at all? Why church? And maybe the question that's underneath that that the world might ask, why God and why Jesus? Why? Why? 
Something I want you to notice in the Gospel of John, I didn't read the whole first chapter. I invite you to do that today or later this week, to really just kind of reread it. It's, a, it's philosophy, it's theology, it's poetry, it's a song, it's all of that. There's a lot there, and you need a couple times, three, four, five, multiple times, just to get, wrap your head around all the nuance that's in this chapter. But I want you to notice one thing in particular today about that very first beginning of John. Because, and I don't understand it, and if you have an issue with this, take it up with John, the writer, not me. But for some reason, the true light that came into the world did not want to come without first having a witness or a testimony to the light. For, for some reason, this light doesn't want to shine until there is a witness kind of gives a new meaning to the old church saying, can I have a witness? <laughs> this light desires a witness, a testimony to the light. Would you join me in prayer? Speak, Lord, for we are listening. I pray in the next moments the words of my mouth, the thoughts and med meditations of each and every heart would be holy and acceptable to you. I do pray with that voice, <laughs> the one that went before, the one who testified to the light. And I would say myself, I am not the light. <laughs> I only want to come by for just a few moments this morning and testify to the light. <clears throat> Help me do that. Help me get out of the way so that the true light that is coming into the world that illuminates all darkness might be experienced by all. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love the way Willimon puts this in his book. He says, part of the challenge of trying to hear the Christmas message as we come to this season again is for many of us, and it may not be for all of us. For some of you, if you've been in a closet for the last years of your life, if you've never seen anything on the news, if you've never watched anything like a movie around Christmas time or any shows, you might not know what the gospel story is about during Christmas, but my guess is most of us do. And one of the things that Willimon is fond of saying, and he wrote this in his book, he says part of the challenge of preparing to hear the good news of Christmas, the good news of Jesus Christ, is that to many of us, it's not news. It's been around for thousands of years. We've heard the story. We've rightly retell the story on an annual basis, and we remember all the elements of the angels singing and bringing that news. And we were reminded of the shepherds who were watching their fields over their flocks by night. And we were reminded of those who traveled to the manger to give honor and praise to the newborn king. But it's not news. Now, it's good. But I mean, if I were to come to you today and say, hey, you're not gonna believe this. God was born of Mary, and it tells us God is for us and not against us. It is a great message. It's a good message, but for many of us, maybe not news. Certainly, it's kind of like breaking news these days. It's never breaking news. It's like been going on for like days or weeks, right? Which means to me, that sometimes we have to get back in touch with why this is good news of great joy for all people. I've been thinking about that for myself. Why am I here? Um, how do I get back in touch with my own testimony? And so I started asking myself those questions this past week. Like, uh, for me, and this is just me speaking now, not for you. But for me, I can't remember when I wasn't a Christian, to be honest with you. Sure, there was a time in my college days when I was wrestling with my faith and I had doubts and I went through what you might call a, a dark moment, um, wrestling, um, dark night of the soul, sometimes it's referred to where I was doing that for a year. A lot of things were happening in my extended family. And, but I can't remember, though, except for those seasons when I was kind of wrestling with my faith. I don't remember ever not confessing Christ, ever not coming to worship. I grew up in 
the Nazarene church. My dad was a Nazarene pastor for 27 years, so I was coming to church before I even knew where we were going and what was happening, right? I kind of cut my teeth on the altar, so to speak. So if I were to go back and remember, when was the first time I encountered Jesus? It would be hard for me to get in touch with that. But I've encountered him over and over and over again throughout my life. Now, I know the story might be different for you. And if I had time today, and I might even ask you to do this for me. If you have time and if you have interest or if God prompts you, I would love to hear your story. Whether you've come to Christ in faith or not, wherever you are, what does Jesus mean to you? Why are you here? Why might you come back again? And and what is it that draws you to this light? What is it that draws you to this hope, this this love that we confess together as followers of Jesus. But it is one of those things that I have found as a conviction in my life and in my ministry especially that we need to in the church both go what I call deep and wide, which makes me think of the song. Do you all know the song? Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. A couple of you Let's try it. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. That's how I feel like it should happen in in discipleship. I've always believed that people who have been following Jesus or at least attempting to do that for a long time should be right next to people who are just trying to ask the questions or just trying to figure it out or just curious or maybe a little bit angry or maybe they have some questions and doubts but they still want to know what's this whole church thing about? What's this whole Jesus thing about? Why why do you do it? Why do you go through these motions? Why Bible study? Why worship? Why all the times? You you seem to be going to church every time the the doors are open. What's, What's up with that? I think those people should be in the same room. That's why I've always thought... As, as, a, as a pastor, as somebody who tries to help other people grow in their faith, I've always thought that we needed to go wide, always getting out in the world, always inviting and uh, people who are asking those questions or who have those doubts or who, who maybe have been hurt by people who proclaim to be Christians. I don't know. The nuns and the duns, but we need to be a light. I, I love the way Brian said it in his message this past week on Wednesday. He said that if, if we're letting the light shine through us, it's like the that's supposed to be dispersed, that's supposed to shine in the dark places. We need to get out there and do that. That's the the wide part. But we also need the deep part, right? We need ways to grow in our faith, ways to deepen our trust, ways to kind of get into the word as believers and, and wrestle with the hard questions. It's okay to do those things. We need we need both. And I think sometimes in the church we have, I think in a wrong-headed kind of way, separated the growth area from the going wide area, and they need to be held together. I'll give you a good example. When I was starting a new church plant in Durham many years ago, and we were having Bible study, and it was amazing because we had these Bible studies. We'd meet midweek, and we would put about 10, 12, 15 people in a room, and some of them, it was a new church plant, but but some people came from other churches to help kind of be missionaries, to help us, so they had been in church for 20, 30, 35 years. You know, and, and there's wisdom in that. There's wisdom in people who have been walking in faith for a long period of time. And they were in the room, and I was grateful for it. But there were also people in the room that were just, they weren't even sure why they were there. Like, they were asking the questions. Like, I don't know, but I, I feel like I need to be here for some reason. I'm asking these questions. I don't understand what this is all about, but something is moving in my spirit, and that's why I'm here. And we were having this wonderful study. I remember it well. But right there in the room, there was a deep and wide in terms of the folks in the room. And we were studying and we were talking about Jesus. And I remember it was a hard one because we were talking about the last days on his earth, of his earthly life, his betrayal, when he was arrested, when he was mocked, when he was beaten, basically tortured, when he was then asked to carry the instrument of his own execution on his back all the way up the hill towards Golgotha. And then we talked about the pain of of, of that final Via Dolorosa, that way of suffering all the way to the cross. And we talked about the witnesses that were there, but probably what most people would have heard were the mock, mocking cries, the derision, the jokes, casting lots for his clothes, talking about, well, save himself, we'll see. 
knew he was this, all the derision, all the mockery, all the hate that was headed towards him hanging on the cross. We were talking about that. And I'll never forget that person that was really questioning, that was wondering why she was there. And she said, can I just, I don't usually talk, but can I say something? And I said, please. It's a small group and this is a safe place. What, what do you want to say? She said, what's with all the blood? What's with all the suffering? She goes, I get the other stuff. I think I came to worship because I understand the love and I understand I want that inner peace and I, and I, I, I desire that for my life because I am, I am a mess. But I've never understood all this with the, the focus of, of you guys on, on the torture and the execution of somebody 2,000 years ago. And it's, it's hard for me to wrap my hand around it. I don't watch violent movies. I can barely understand all these hymns, all these songs. The blood will never lose its power. All these songs about there's power in the blood. You know, I just, it's, it's disturbing, is what she said. And I want you to know what bothered me most was not, none of her questions. What bothered me most was the reactions of other people in the room. And, and they weren't mean, they weren't ugly, but they were like almost trying to, Christian splain real quick. Oh, no, you should understand it's really okay. And oh, this is actually a really good thing. And, and just kind of, I don't think they said it, but it almost got the feel, I almost got the sense like they felt like they needed to defend God and that this was bordering on heresy to talk this way, right? They were, they were kind of upset that somebody would ask these questions. And I tried to lovingly kind of speak to everybody in the room and I said, let's, let's pause for a moment. Let's do a timeout. Let's just remind ourselves. She's right. This is scandalous. Paul knew it. He said the cross is foolishness to the Greeks, and it is a stumbling block to Jews. They don't understand what in the world does this mean. And I think sometimes when we're, that, that's the re reason if you're a seasoned Christian, you need to be next to people that are asking these questions because sometimes we forget the cross is a scandal, folks. It's hard to wrap our heads around it. But the reason I shared that story with you this morning is because I left that night with a different testimony, grateful for this person who's right on the edge of encountering Christ and questioning and asking these deep, hard questions. What I found out later, if we would quit you know, trying to tell her what not to think or say, what I discovered is that she had a family member brutally murdered in front of her. So blood brought different things to her mind, right? And um, she was trying to understand what that means. Now, we were able to have a conversation around how, yes, the world does do violence to Jesus. And the world does do violence to one another. And it is horrific. And that's not the good part. That is not the good news part. The good news part is that Jesus overcame that violence. <laughs> the good news part is that Jesus rose again on the third day. And the good news part is that even in the midst of pain and suffering, God can turn it around and transform it. And that God enters into it. I say that because what I left with that night was a testimony myself. Because I was reminded again, this is why I'm a pastor. This is why I came to testify to the light. I'm not the light, but I want to testify to the light because I see broken people. I see people that have been hurt from trauma. I see people who don't quite understand where they land in God's will and God's plan for their life. And I want to testify that because of the light that I've experienced, I just have to say what Jesus has done for me. That's all I can say. And I'm not going to judge you where you are, but I'd love to hear your story. Where are you on your journey with Jesus? So I picked up the Gospel of John, and we were listening to how John says, I am not the light, but I came to testify to the light. And the light, the true light that was coming into the world was coming, and the darkness would not overcome it. And then I was kind of walking through the Gospel of John, and I was reminded there's all kinds of, this, this gospel is all about testimony, by the way, from the first chapter all the way to the final chapter of John. Everywhere throughout, it's 
Who's testifying? Who's the witness? Who's the one that's going to point? Who's the one that's going to get back in touch with why you're here and why Jesus matters? And it doesn't matter whether you've been walking with Jesus for 30 years or if you're right here on the edge, you're not even sure why you're here at all or whether you actually are standing back and say, I don't believe this at all. I'm just here because my, my family member told me to come, right? I, it doesn't matter where you are. My question for you today is where are you and why are you here and can I tell you about my encounter with the true light? As I walk through this passage, you hear these testimonies. They're different. Everybody coming to Jesus, a little different. In the second chapter, we hear about Nick, Nicodemus, who comes at night, right? Now, he's, he's, he's one that's on the edge. He doesn't understand. He sees something, but he doesn't want to proclaim it. It might bring shade. He might have problems with his colleagues in the, among the temple and the priest. So he comes to Jesus at night. He asks questions. What, what must I do to be saved? He has this conversation with Jesus. And you might think it's over there, but if you go all the way to the end of the gospel, you'll notice that it says Nicodemus, the one who came to him at night, was there to anoint his body after his death. In his own way, he testified to the light. I don't know everything he said throughout the rest of his life. I don't know where he went necessarily, all the things. We don't know all his story. We have little glimpses throughout the Gospel of John, a time when he kind of stops the rest of the leaders from going too far, but he's constantly in his way trying to disperse light. He too was a testimony to the light. Skip over to chapter four. You'll discover somebody else who encountered this light. Jesus travels to Samaria. He meets this woman at the well, and it's one of the first, and I want you to understand one of the first evangelists in scripture was a woman and this woman traveled all the way back to her town after she had this encounter with Jesus, this conversation with Jesus at the well. And she had questions, and they weren't nice. And maybe somebody would have thought in the Bible study, hey, those are kind of heretical. That's Jesus, man. Step back. And she stepped forward, and she brought all of her hard questions. And she left, and she told everyone. I, I want you to hear what they said. In verse 39, she ran back to her village. She announced, testifying to the light, and it says this, Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. <laughs> she too testified to the lies. This isn't just John the Baptist. It's not just Nicodemus. It's also the woman at the well. If you skip over to, to, to chapter 5, I want you to hear what Jesus says about testimonies. What he says about witnesses. Now, this may make you a little bit uncomfortable. What I should have said at the beginning when I asked you, why are you here? What I wanted to say, too, is that you might leave a little bit uncomfortable because if you don't like to witness or give testimony, and I don't mean you have to stand up here in front of a microphone and do something big. I just mean give an account. I just mean care enough about Jesus to share with somebody else just as much as you might care to share about your favorite football team or your favorite basketball that's problem, problematic for me because a lot of you know I love Duke. I just want you to also know I love Jesus. <laughs> Listen to what Jesus says about testimonies in chapter 5. I can do nothing on my own as I hear. I judge. My judgment is because of what I seek to do on my own. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There's another who testifies on my behalf. What did I just say about the character of this light? It wants a testimony. It wants a witness. It needs other people to shine and point to the true light that is not just come in the world in Jesus, but continues to come, continues to bless, continues to heal, continues to save. And we need to be witnesses and testimonies to that light. Jesus said it himself, I don't test about, about myself. This, for some reason, the character of this light needs a witness and a testimony. Now, he would go on to say, my father testifies through the works that I do and the miracles that I perform. And then he goes on to say the scriptures testify. So if you dig into the scriptures, you'll realize they testify to the true light that's coming into the world. That's Jesus telling us himself. Skip over to verse or chapter. Um, let's see. Let me go one more. Let's go all the way to the end of the, of the gospel. You might miss this, but when you get there, you're reminded at the crucifixion. Now, in this gospel, it, there's not the centurion who says, my Lord and my God, but there's a soldier who is told to make sure that Jesus is dead. And so he pierces his side, and what, what blood and water flow. 
And then you hear this in the gospel. It says, but when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. But then listen to this verse. They're talking about the soldier. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. Jesus turned a soldier at the cross who literally stuck a spear in his side, turned him into a witness to the light. He now testifies so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. And these things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. I'll give you two more. Thomas, after Jesus rose from the dead. I'm not going to believe unless I see the scars. I'm not going to believe. I'm, I can't be a witness. I can't testify to something I haven't experienced. And then Jesus shows. He appears to him again in that upper room. Thomas goes down. He touches the scars and the scars in his side and in his hands. He says, my Lord and my God. Thomas becomes a testimony to the light. And then the writer of John concludes the entire gospel with these words. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things. This is chapter 21, the very end of the gospel. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things. In other words, the entire gospel is nothing but his testimony. He wants you to know, I've experienced the light. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them down, and we know that his testimony is true. But hear this, church. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. The subtext means, and nobody knows about all those, unless there's a witness. <laughs> I think I'm going to not mic drop. There are many other things Jesus has done and is doing. Who will know unless you tell them? You didn't know this was a rec recruitment sermon, did you? <laughs> Can I get a witness? Does anybody here have a testimony? And if you don't, that's okay. Honestly, no judgment. But I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to have prayer with you. I'll meet with you right after this service. We can go in the back here. Not because of any expectation I have, just I would like to hear your story. I would like to know where you are, why you're here. Because I'm here. I'll just say it. I'm here because I want to testify to the light. Because that light has illuminated my life, and I've never been the same since it touched my heart. I want to end with a story maybe you've heard. Robert Louis Stevenson is known well for a lot of the books that he's written, Treasure Island and others like that. What people may not know about him is, is um, as a little kid, you know, he was kind of sickly, couldn't leave his room a lot, and he had a nurse that was caring for him uh, during that season, and he, one evening, was watching at night out the window. He lived in Edinburgh, Scotland, so that's where he grew up. And he was looking out the window, and back then, it's when the, the lamp posts up and down the street were not electric, right? So they were oil lamps. And there was this process whereby <laughs> the lamp lighters would literally come to each lamp, and they would put their ladder on it, and they would walk up to the top, and they would literally light the lamp, and then walk back down, and then they would go over to the next lamp, put their ladder down, and then walk up the ladder and light that lamp and go down the entire street lighting the lamps of the street. And he was watching this as a kid from his window, fascinated. And the nurse came in wondering, like, what is he doing? Why is he so enthralled by the window? And she asked him, Robert, what, what, are, you, what are you looking at? What are you doing? And he looked at her and he said, I'm watching this man punch holes in the darkness. <laughs> we 
Would you like to join me in punching some holes in the darkness? <laughs> All you got to do is say, yes, I'll testify to the light. And before you say, oh, but not me, God can't use me, I'll be like, eh, try again, try again. Maybe the prayer we should leave with today is the same thing that John said about himself. My name's Kevin. I'm not the light. I am not the light. But I am here because I want to testify to the light. And maybe John, along with Nicodemus, along with the woman, I don't know her name, that was at the well, along with the soldier, I don't know his name, but he was at the cross along with Thomas, who had all kinds of questions and doubts, maybe you could add your name to the list. Sarah and Tom, Ashley. Maybe you could add your name to the list. I, too, will testify to the light. For the light has come into the world, and the darkness has not overcome it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, sometimes we don't think we have a voice, but you've given us a voice. Sometimes we don't think we could be a vessel that would allow light to shine through us, but you've created us in your image and you desire to meet us where we are. And Lord, sometimes we are not just humbled, but sometimes scared to death that you would purpose us with the task of being witnesses, of being those who would testify, that would have to, in some way, in word and in deed, point to you. But give us a holy boldness to offer ourselves as witnesses to the light this day, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ago, three wise men left their home. Then an angel of the Lord said, Seek the Savior born. Logic told them they were crazy, they shouldn't even try. They followed their hearts, they followed that star this Christmas. Let me be that wise. Love them all so much on 
that first night he was the light this Christmas let me feel that love keep that faith be that wise feel that love this Christmas sense when you're lost in wonder and love and praise and you forget to come pray. <laughs> Thank you for that, Angie. Let us pray. That love, that grace, that peace, give it to us this Christmas. Take these gifts, take our lives, consecrate us. Help us be bold enough to witness to the light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, go now in the grace and the peace of God the Father, the love of Jesus Christ, his only Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to leave this building and be, be the, the church, church or be the light. Amen. <laughs> Have a good week. We'll see you soon.